like a J.J. Abrams TV show. It just pops in and out right at the point. <laughs> yeah. Here we are. Hey, everyone. Uh, Vivek just dropped off. I, we don't know why. But uh, meet Zach and Katie. Uh, uh, just to, you know, uh, address, you know, just to tell my experience with them. Like, these are one of the smartest and beautiful people I know. And they have been my gurus for like past three months in design thinking. I started off just with a hackathon and submitted it. And I uh, started talking to Zach about, you know, what can we do better and stuff, you know, like my personal views. And uh, then I got to introduce to design thinking and, you know, uh, what the product design is basically. And then they started uh, taking weekly calls with me and show me, you know, how we can... Uh, work on designs and what are the tools and stuff and I've learned a lot from them and I have implemented those learnings a lot in kernel too and these guys are like awesome so hoping you guys would have a blast too and uh, you know learn more about how to not build shit that people don't want so over to you Zach and Katie Thanks, Sachin. Um, yeah, so I, I think this is supposed to be an open Q&A. Uh, we can kind of just sort of go over what we've been working on and how we sort of think about design product um, while you kind of think of, of the uh, questions. Hopefully you saw the uh, presentation that we gave at ETH Denver. Honestly, like people ask me, like uh, people have asked, like, you know, can you can you speak? And I'm I, Sachin, in fact, I was like, well, can you speak? I was like, honestly, we would just give this. I feel like this talk is the one that uh, has the most mileage, like the, like the most interesting insights to give, um, because it's basically a summary of everything that we have done over the past, I would say, two years within the blockchain space, probably another two, like another year and a half, two years consulting. Um, and just to kind of give you an idea, like we were consulting before consensus, we were consulting in web two companies, actually. So like, um, a lot of the, I mean, like kind of Sachin was talking about design thinking, design thinking, like my introduction to it was a, uh, it was in the web too. It was, it was a Google book, actually Google sprint, uh, that Jake Knapp and I cannot remember the other guy's name. I'm sorry. Other guy, um, they wrote <laughs> for Google, they wrote for Google ventures. Uh, this was essentially their sort of like design thinking workshop sort of methodology. Katie was actually introduced to it a lot earlier. Um, and yeah, uh, we've been, we've been consulting with web two companies, everything from, uh, everything from kind of Fortune 500 to uh, startups and that sort of thing. And, and we've basically been working in that. And then we spent two years in consensus doing a lot of the same things for these Web2 companies, taking those same methodologies and sort of importing them into the, the Web3 space, uh, which given given how much longer it takes and uh, how much, I would say, nichier the products are, it's actually uh, fine. I think it's, it's even more effective in this space than it is in the Web2. So Katie, why don't, why don't you kind of give a quick intro yeah. as well? Um, and Katie, if you don't mind, maybe I could squeeze in really quick just to set the stage a bit. That's what I wanted to do. Just because like, I want Katie and Zach to also know like where we are in the cohort. And I think that that will be like useful context. So just, you know, so everyone, first of all, congrats on a great week zero. I think we did a fantastic job with our goals, which was basically just building trust, getting to know each other, um, and uh, really appreciate everyone's, um, yeah, participation. And thanks, Leon. This is like really all that matters is is this. So um, it's the people and we're like all here together to do this. So um, with that, everyone should have gotten a week zero highlights slash week one kickoff email. Um, and the week zero highlights just talks about all the stuff that got done. There are 42 projects on the kernel projects teams list, of which I think could benefit from talking to Katie and Zach. Uh, there are a lot of really cool highlights from what happened, a lot of stories from even week one, and we want your feedback, so just look through all that. Um, here, we're kicking off week one, and this is the first event of uh, what we're calling the Designer's Garden. Um, I think that sprinting is, is a great concept, and there will be hyper sprints um, this week and, and thoughts about that, but, but Zach and Katie uh, have been people in my life who have, who have really forced me to slow down, actually, and, and to think about what users are thinking. Um, and to consider things uh, just more carefully before before moving on to to just like building something. So um, I think that's the, the best the best place to kick off. Tomorrow we're going to do a hyper sprint session with Deep Work, who are friends of Zach and Katie. Tomorrow morning, uh, where we will be um, basically introducing the hyper sprint process and your deliverables for this week uh, as project teams. So for the forty two teams, uh, it'll be quite simple. Um, 
uh, we'll, we'll ask for a, a prototype by the end of the week uh, based on your user testing and feedback. Um, and then the last piece, which is which is always uh, the case in kernel, is that there are reading materials for the uh, session on Thursday. So module one is now live here. Uh, Vinay Gupta is going to join us on uh, Thursday to talk through what's going on this uh, with this week's work. Uh, Ethereum's history and state, we think he's one of the best people uh, to come kick off with us. Uh, the two things I'd point you to, other than the craft of reading, are um, Promises, Promises, which is Unrecognizable Capitalism by Vinay Gupta. It's one of his early talks from like 2015, and it talks about the history of computing from the 1950s uh, to today. Uh, and then Joyful Subversion, which I think Zach and Katie might appreciate, which is uh, from uh, a former design lead at Apple, VP of Design at Khan Academy, Meili Co., um, talking about how you subvert the status quo, how you do that in your product building experiences and in your life, perhaps more generally. Um, so yeah, this is Design Week. Uh, thanks for letting me sneak in there. And Katie, we'd love to hear your intro. Uh, yeah, of course, Vic, anytime. You can always you can always jump me in the line. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Katie Johnson. Uh, I am Zach's partner in Relays. Uh, I am actually now at Google just started last week in a U new UXR role for assistant. Um, but so I'm a little bit in transition right now, which means I'm a little bit less available normally than I'd like to be, but I'm here and I'm excited to be here to answer questions. Um, as Zach said, uh, I did get into design thinking um, way back uh, 10 years ago, some 10 years ago now, uh, I was trained in the Luma methods um, and used to teach Luma all around the world in um, all, like literally all around the world I taught in uh, Europe, India, and China mostly, and then all, of course all over the United States as well. Um, before I really got into kind of UX specifically, um, I taught human-centered design. So really, really excited to be here and to learn from, from you and to hear what your questions are um, and to just kind of see what's going on. Um, so yeah, bring bring on the questions. Yeah, yeah. I think such and were there some questions in the question section? I saw like three or four there, but now, yeah, it, it's the airmaid thingy. I don't know, but uh, anyone can raise their hand or they can ask their questions in the question section. Uh, mm -hmm. I was really happy to you know uh, see that people have uh, watched the workshop and they have been providing the feedbacks mm -hmm. and views on the Slack channel. Okay, so we have one raise hand. How this yeah. kicks off the week out. I'm so sorry, Vivek. Uh, yeah, so sorry, Vivek. Hi, Katie. Hi, Zach. Uh, uh, really excited to be here. Just, uh, I'm I'm a huge fan of uh, user synthesis, and uh, I just wanted to know, uh, you know, uh, how how uh, often should we uh, do uh, a user synthesis? Is there some milestone which we should aim for? Uh, and, uh, could you, <clears throat> could yeah. you define user synthesis just before I go off on a tangent? <laughs> when sure. you say synthesis, so, do you mean, do you mean like taking, taking all of your learnings and sort of compiling them? Or do you mean like taking, like just going off and, and talking to users at like one off? Like, uh, I guess like walk me through that just so I can, I make sure I'm. Sure, sure, sure. It's, uh, it's about, uh, validating the hypothesis and, uh, talking to, uh, users individually and seeing uh, where our idea fit. And uh, of course, uh, uh, I've seen uh, most of the ideas, uh, the best ones, they come from uh, uh, those uh, user feedback session. So just wanted to know the right time to do it and how often uh, we should do it. Uh, I really like the graph, uh, which shows that, you know, uh, 10 users uh, uh, synthesis or uh, 10 users uh, feedback is really cool. But yeah, wanted to learn more about that. It's more of a case. Do you want me to take this one? It's just to jump in the line again. Uh, there are like a lot of questions in the chat too and the question section. So if you guys want to look into that too, like, yeah. I'm be really yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to answer I, the ones that are live. Prior, priority first for those okay. live ones so we can can do the live ones or we can bring ones in from the chat live but it's it's a lot to be answering a question and trying to also type um so i'm gonna yeah. just focus 
first this question, um, which is about user feedback. My apologies for the baby crying in the background. He's leaving momentarily. Um, that's why he's crying. So uh, we recommend basically, I mean, I think Zach actually puts this in a, in a really good frame, which is you're improving your, and you already said this, right? Uh, you're improving your product every single time you do user feedback sessions. So that is how often you're going to improve your product. If you do them monthly, you're going to improve your product monthly. If you're going to do user feedback sessions yearly, you're going to do them yearly. Um, I personally am a user researcher, so I would tell you that the more often you can do them, the better. Um, and the more that you make it part of your practice to do them, the more that it will be natural to do them and the more that it will feel unnatural when you don't do them. Um, it's like when you're working out, if you're working out every day and then you don't work out, you kind of miss it. If you're working out never, and then you work out once, it's really, really, really painful, right? So I think it's important to do them as often as you humanly possibly can, understanding that there are other things you have to do when you're doing all the work as a startup on your own. Um, however, that having been said, Feedback sessions can be as short as five minutes. They can be very, very short. Uh, they can be asynchronous. They can be unmoderated. You can run unmoderated usability tests, um, in which case you don't even need to be there, right? Uh, there are tools to help you do analysis. Uh, there's, I have a great friend who's building something, um, a really great user insights tool called Tetra that helps you do analysis. Um, so there's a lot of stuff out there to help. Uh, unmoderated usability tests are the, are the best thing for people that don't have any time. There's no excuse for not doing unmoderated usability tests. Um, so if you, if you can't do anything, do that. Um, and, and yeah, I think personally, the more often the better. I would strive at this point, especially in a startup in the beginning, I would strive for weekly. Uh, I think that would be a good goal. Zach, do you have anything to add to that or? Yeah, no, I mean, I agree weekly, right? I mean, like, I think especially, so let me put it this way, in blockchain, we're, we are, uh, we have a very high index of developers, right? It's a technical, it's a technical landscape. Um, we tend to have teams where uh, usually there's like one business person and maybe one to three developers on it. As developers, I code a little bit as well as design as developers. I think one of the things that we love to do is we love to build. That's kind of why we started developing in the first place, right? Um, the reason why it's important to encode these sort of these sort of feedback sessions in is because you could get too far off from what people actually want, right? Um, it's like this idea of trajectory, right? You're starting here, you're pointed here, or you're pointed here. There's really not a ton of difference. But suddenly, if you're out this way, we're talking about either like here, or we're talking about here. It's like, it's a vast difference in where you up on the map. Uh, and so I think it's important to build uh, feedback sessions into a cadence. Uh, a weekly cadence, I think is, is perfect. But I would say that it's not just sort of like, okay, well, I have to do I have to do this, I have to like talk to a user a week, it's important to think of it in terms of your entire production flow, right? If you you need to probably be thinking about um, what you're building in terms of a week, like how fast can we get through this like week uh, uh, sprint, essentially, like put put sort of these features uh, behind like a flag, start testing them out. But like, don't essentially don't go off at, for too long and build something. Um, make sure that like at every step of the process, you're showing it to people. Uh, and then I posted in the chat, um, I think passive, uh, passive feedback loops is also really important to encode in. Um, you'd be surprised how many projects I talk to that don't even have Google Analytics. Uh, on their site. Um, so they don't even know how many people are looking at their site, what they're looking at, what they're clicking on. Um, these are things that you can make pretty strong inferences from, right? Like I was put, I was said, uh, I just posted Hotjar in it. Um, it records user sessions anonymously, it blocks out, uh, it blocks out different, uh, uh, like sort of identifying data. Um, I would still like kind of look into it before you deploy it kind of on, on anything that's uh, web, web three, especially like DeFi. Um, but you can find out where people rage quit on Hotjar, which I found extremely helpful, right? Like you can watch sessions and find find out where they drop off on the page, find out where they, they are having trouble. Um, you can actually, if you pay for it, start tagging uh, tagging different videos uh, so you can share with the, with the people. Um, I think talking to people is really important. And I think also thinking of it in terms of like, if you have to create as many channels of people giving you information back, as you build, as you put stuff out in the world, you have to create channels for people to give stuff back to you in order for you to improve the product. Because it is like you talk to, you find, you talk to users and by talking, we mean like watching videos or looking at Google Analytics. Like you open up those channels and kind of intake data. Every time you do that, you will improve your product. So the more you can 
do that and the tighter the iteration loops, the feedback loops that you can incorporate, the better your product's going to be uh, at, at a much higher rate uh, as of other competing products. That's, awesome. yeah. Thanks, thanks guys. So thanks for asking us. I, I do have other questions, but yeah, I'll let other people uh, uh, ask their questions first. Yeah. And then thanks I'll for back. asking the questioners and I'll hand uh, Mike to Andy. Hang on, uh, I wonder, um, you know, this video that you shared is really great in terms of speaking about feedback loops, uh, you know, generative, formative, evaluative. I love the model that you've put together. Uh, but I wonder if you can speak just a little bit from a more personal level about how in your own practice over the last 10 years or however long you've been doing this, how you think personally about the kinds of questions that you ask at different stages in this quite well-defined model. How is it that you draw the most information out of people without leading them in any way in your designs? And, you know, perhaps just share some, like some of the human stories around, you know, particular moments of insights uh, that you've had in this human-centered design work that would be really interesting to hear. I, Katie, I can take the, how, what questions do I ask if you want to talk about not leading people? Cause I'm terrible at that. Is that all right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah sure. Uh, so leading people is really hard. I mean, I'm going to be super honest. I still do it. Um, don't tell Google that. Okay. But like, uh, I still do it. And uh, it's really, really hard to shake it because you want them to say what you want them to say, whether it's this product is great or this product is broken or I'm in a fight. You know, if you're in a fight with your your designer and you're like, I want to prove to the designer they're wrong. Like I want to get 10 users to say their design sucks, right? You have something in your mind that you want them to say. Uh, the best thing that you can do, the best thing you can do is write good moderation guides and stick to them. And the way that I recommend doing that is start with the research questions. Research questions are absolutely key and they should be very, very uh, robust research questions. So when I say research questions, it should not, the research question should not be, can someone use my product? That is not a research question. A research question is a rich, robust, experiential question around how someone experiences something. Uh, and it should not be answerable with one specific flow. It should not be answerable with one specific test. And then what you do is you start with the research questions. I literally do this on paper. Not kidding. I take paper, I get away from my computer, and I write questions, and I use abstraction laddering, which would be basically... To make it super simple, abstraction lettering is basically keep asking why until you get to the base of it. And then I, once I have a really robust re, uh, set of user questions or research questions, usually around three per study, um, I then take those questions and I write a moderation guide. And the moderation guide would then be like the kernel, no, no pun intended, the kernel question taken and kind of like mapped out into all of its children questions, right? So if you have this parent question, you then have several children questions uh, that end up having several children of their own. You have like grandchildren of questions, right? Uh, and then you end up with this beautiful moderation guide. And then the key is to stick to it. I, I have been doing this for 12 years. And I'm telling you right now, when I run studies, I use moderation guides. I do not go off script. When I go off script, I lead. Like, and that having been said, when I go off script, because you do, uh, because someone, so back to your human stories question, uh, someone will say something that you didn't anticipate, right? They'll say something, they'll confess something that you're like, oh my God, that's, that's huge. I need to go down that route. And when that happens, I've found, and Zach and I joke about this actually, that you want to say a lot to fill the space, but the less you say, the better. So if you can just say why, that might be kind of awkward, but that's the best thing you can do other than just some, I'll give you an example since you asked. Uh, I did a study once on parents of children who uh, were, di had been diagnosed with ADHD, um, studying how the parents were feeling. And we were studying how parents were interacting with their child at home. Okay. And the confession that came out in the study was, that was unanticipated, was that basically the parents had become enemies with the teachers at school that the teachers were sending home reports saying that the children were behaving badly all day and that the parents, you know, would the parents were basically suspicious of the teachers not trying with their kid. Right. Um, and so that was an enormous revelation that actually ended up leading to a completely different product. We, we pivoted the product. And instead of it being about how parents originally, the product was about how parents track their interactions with their kids when their kids get home from school, it now became about, 
creating a bridge between the teachers and the parents because that relationship was broken on both sides. But that insight happened in a study that was about usability of the product we had already built and it was the completely wrong product. Someone else asked in the chat, Vivek, I'm doing what you said. Someone else in the chat about uh, how you know if you're ta targeting the wrong thing. This is a perfect example. Some, if you're doing frequent studies, things are going to come up that are going to be like mind boggling. If you're listening, if you've asked robust research questions, and if that happens, like it happened for us, we were building a tool that nobody wanted. And instead, they, but they didn't say we don't want it. They were being very generous. They were, they were acting like it was great. And then they confessed this huge major confession that was that there was this broken relationship around the child. And we pivoted the product to be this, this other thing. Um, so you have to be listening and you have to be willing to just follow that, that cell, that way down. Um, and an example of a robust research question is one that, sh so when you look at the question, you should not be able to answer it with a specific, uh, one specific question in an interview, say, or in a, in a usability test. It should be such a rich question. For example, um, what is the experience of being a parent of a child who has been diagnosed with ADHD? That is a robust research question, right? Like that is not a question that is going to be answered. You cannot ask, you can ask a parent that question and they're going to say something like, I mean, it's, it's hard. It's really hard. That doesn't help you. Right. But when you, if you take that question, if that's the true question, it's going to have children questions that are like, tell me about what it's like to see your kid come home from school every day. And they're going to tell you they're crying every day. I literally had parents crying on these calls. They're crying every day. They don't feel like they fit in. They don't know how to succeed. I'm worried that I have either genetically or uh, environmentally ruined their chances at having a good life. And they're crying, right? Like that is the experience. That's not going to be a question they're going to answer. But when you've got a parent crying on a call with you with someone you just met telling you how hard it is to watch their child fail at school, that's the experience. It's ethereal. It's hard to grab onto. And when you have it in your hand and you're trying to build a product to help them, the next time you make a product decision, you're going to think about that parent. You're going to think about them crying. You're going to think about how hard it is to be a parent of a kid who is not doing well at school because their teacher and the school system is not set up to, to help them succeed. And you are building a product to save their life, like save their future, their potential. And all of a sudden you care a whole lot more about this product that is going to change someone's life. A robust research question puts you truly in the shoes of the person you're trying to help. And let me tell you, there is not one product I have ever worked on that I don't get that emotional about. If you're not that emotional about your product, you're doing not enough research. Like, get out there and get to know the people you're helping. Because if you don't care about your product as much as I care about that product that I worked on three years ago, you're doing it wrong. I would just add to that that honestly, I mean, like... If you don't, if the users that you're serving are the, if you don't have an emotional investment in the users that you're serving being successful, then you're in the wrong, you're building the wrong product, period, right? Like this is even outside of doing user testing because you have to think about the type of products that you're building. If you are building a product that is going to be interfacing with salespeople all the time, but you don't like salespeople, that means you're going to have to be interacting with, you're going to be championing, you're going to be trying to you're going to be trying to rescue the day for people that you probably don't have a ton of empathy with. Um, I think that research is an amazing way to start finding empathy for the users. But I would say like, just right off the bat, find a customer base that you want to see succeed in life. Those are the people that you should be building for. <laughs> like just in general, right? Uh, we were, I was halfway through a product where uh, we were actually seeing traction and people were signing up. They were, they were putting in their credit card number. They were giving us like we had, we had monthly, we had monthly subscriptions. And then like midway through, we both kind of realized we we're like, I really, I don't care. I, I don't care enough about this user segment in order to devote the next 10 years of my life, making their lives better. It's a really, it's a, it's kind of a crappy thing to admit, but I think it's also important to like own it <laughs> like emotionally, right? If you're the founder, right? Like you can, if you start working uh, at a company where you're employee number five through employee number 15 or 20 or 50 or a thousand, like you can sort of outsource that empathy to other people in the company, unless you're like the product person or the researcher or the designer, in which case you can never outsource that empathy, but um, you can outsource that and you can just say like, no, I'm just, I want to build cool tech. I want to build cool things. I want to I, like, this is cool and I want it to be cool. But if you're the founder or if you're employee number one, 
and you don't care whether or not their lives are going to be better after using your product, then the incentives are probably misaligned. That's what I would add to that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Andy, for asking the question. Definitely emotional. That was a great question. Brain. These are all great questions so far, by the way. <laughs> and I'm going to, since we have a lot of questions and a lot of phrase hands, I'm just going to, you know, rapid fire questions. So there's a beautiful question from Simon, who is himself is a product designer. And he, he's basically asking, you know, uh, what's your experience with targeting non-crypto users? Because that's one of the questions, like, mostly, uh, like, most of the audience already have. And they're like... When, when he says targeting crypto users, or non-crypto users, does he mean targeting non-crypto users for crypto products? Or just how does targeting non-crypto users work? Yeah, so, like, even if there are, like, the products are on blockchain and Ethereum, mm -hmm. like we should have a UX which abstract all that, you know, Web3 stuff. So, mm -hmm. that's the essential question. Right. If, well, I mean, you're targeting uh, mass adoption at some point. Right. Or you're, or you're, you're essentially trying to edge into niche markets that aren't Basically, necessarily. The, yeah. Uh, Tony, into niche markets. Yeah. T uh, Tony, uh, Tony Shang had, I think, one of my favorite dichotomies of the types of users that you see in the blockchain space. You have ethos users and then secular users. Ethos users are people who, um, who use blockchain because they believe in some sort of aspect of it, right? Like they were really burned in 2008 crisis. And so they believe in uh, solid money or they, uh, et cetera. Um, and then you have sort of secular users who are just sort of like, I don't really, I don't really care. I just, I want my problems solved. Um, generally speaking, when you're talking to web two users, I think you actually have to start thinking about it in terms of those secular users. I think we've hit the saturation point, uh, in the user space of ethos users. I think everyone who believes in self-sovereign identity or, um, those uh, like the, the type of money outside of like another giant, massive shock to the system, which hell it's 2020, we've got six months left and, and there's no guarantee that 2021 is going to be any better. Uh, maybe that massive shock to the system's coming and everybody's going to turn into an ethos user who super cares about privacy and super cares about all this stuff. Um, but I think, I think what you need to start doing it, I mean, like, honestly, when you start thinking about, um, when you start thinking about targeting web two users uh, or people who aren't necessarily, I'm, I'm going to say like not targeting web two users. I'm going to say targeting people who don't necessarily care whether it's in a centralized database or crypto or don't necessarily care that it's like, is it a web three tech or is it a D web tech or is it, is it a traditional? They just want their problem solved. Um, I think it, I think, A, you're asking the right questions because I think that because we've hit that saturation point, I think you need to start, we need to start thinking about reaching into sectors that aren't, um, going to use it just because it's a, just because of sort of like the ethos promise of, of self-sovereignty. Um, and I would say just get really, really targeted and really, really specific about the problems you're, you're solving. I think one of the worst things that you, I think one of them probably shouldn't say worst thing because it's worked out before. It's hard to say like, this is a terrible strategy, but I think you are in trouble if whenever you're building your product and you say, well, who's going to use it? You don't have a really, really specific niche in mind. Uh, Peter Thiel's zero to one, uh, talks about how it's not about like when you're talking to a when you're talking to a VC, they want to hear all about like the giant market that you can sell to. That's great. But it's actually more important, especially when you're building that first product to have a really, really like focused niche that you can sort of attack uh, and find like sort of that beachhead audience that you can that you can sell to. Um, and that's, in my opinion, is how you actually get to those the Web2 users. And then I would say that like how you think about them using crypto is you need to have a really, really robust gap analysis uh, of what is possible in the Web3 space versus what is possible in the Web2 space, because their expectations are going to be a Web2 experience, right? Like if you built a Web3 Twitter, everyone who is not already on crypto would rage quit if they saw that they had to spend what's the current, like what's the most recent gas, uh, right? Like if they had to spend like 30 cents to tweet Nobody would use it, right? And you can say like, well, meta transaction, blah, blah, blah. But that's important to understand is like what they're, what, uh, how they're expecting their uh, experience to be right now uh, and then understand ways to mitigate it or understand how crypto can be a 10x, 10 to 100x is generally what you shoot for whenever you're expecting people to modify their existing behavioral patterns to suit your new products, right? So you want to either look for a 10x save reduction in cost or a 10x improvement uh, in product productivity or production or that sort of thing. Um, so that's what, that's what my answer would be. Sorry, my cat is biting me. So I'll let him out. So I'll be.
Yeah, no worries. Uh, uh, can I take over because I'm going to answer Vivek's question as part okay. of this answer as well. Yeah. Uh, so Vivek's question is, how do you know if you have a good product but you're targeting the wrong audience? Pretty much how do you know if you're targeting the right people? I kind of already talked about this a little bit. Zach just talked about this a little bit, um, but I'll build on Zach's question to kind of knock Vivek's question out and then we can move down the list. Uh, I, I agree with what Zach said. Basically, you know you're targeting the wrong people. Uh, so the question, it's kind of twofold, right? Are you targeting the wrong people or have you solved the wrong problem? Uh, you could be still targeting the right people, but you're solving the wrong problem. And again, this goes back to, Andy actually talked about this when he came on screen before. Uh, you've got uh, foundational, generative, and evaluative research at your disposal. Research is not a one-trick pony. You cannot, you know, don't use a survey if you should be doing foundational research. Foundational research is about going, and sometimes people lump foundational and generative together. So let me just add add that. Um, but basically foundational in my mind, the way I was taught foundational research is about going out and understanding the user in their space, not about selling them something, right? What are they doing right now? What are they doing right now that sucks that you're going to make better to Zach's point, preferably 10 times better, right? If you're going out and you're looking at a user and you're thinking, Right now, they're going through this horrible process where they're trying to get a loan, but they have really bad credit because they have an education or they had a they had their identity stolen and they can't get credit and now they can't buy a house. And this person is going to be trapped forever in this doom loop of never being able to buy a house. Oh my God, that's a great case for DeFi, right? Okay, they, they are never going to be recognized by the centralized financial system that we have in place because they were their identity was stolen when they were 20 and they were a victim of this terrible thing that happened and now they're trapped forever in this doom loop. You're going to make their experience 10 times better because you're going to give them access to credit for the first time in their life, which means they can actually go do something, right? They can buy a house, they can buy a car, they can go to school, They can. you're opening access for them. Um, when you see that kind of thing, that's that's understanding foundational research where they are without trying to sell them anything. If you truly understand that and you truly understand their problem and truly understand what you're trying to solve, you should already have the right audience if you've done your research. However, if you get to generative and evaluative research, generative being making with the user, which you should absolutely do, it's the most skipped research step, build your product with your user. I cannot say it enough. Bring them into your building sessions. They want to be there. So bring them in. They want to build with you. Um, and help them see what you're trying to do so that you can build it together. The most overused, I think, version of research, don't don't take that to mean don't do it, is evaluative research in that people are showing stuff and getting feedback. That feedback needs to be honest. It needs to be very clear. And if it's not good, if it's, if it's sorry, if it's good feedback, but it's not positive feedback about your thing, you need to dig in on what it is to figure out if you're targeting the wrong user or if you've solved the wrong problem. Um, and I think that answers that question. So now I see we have a question. Sachin, do you, you want to do the question? Yeah. So that's what, right? Like, uh, there are two questions around it. Like, you uh, pretty much covered, like, what the process should be. And, you know, like, uh, solving the right problem and targeting the right people. But, you know, there's a very high chance of overthinking in design thinking while you are doing it. You know, so what the process should be to not overthink and what kind of tools can we use uh, to sketch our prototype and make it along with the users and, uh, you know. I'll let Zach speak to prototyping a little bit more. Um, my vote would be for Figma. Uh, personally, as someone who's not a designer, I, I personally love Figma and I think it's easy to use and I think it's very easy to collaborate with others on. Um, I do think that sometimes with users, it does get a little bit, weird to bring them into a Figma, but I'd like Zach to speak to that. From my personal experience, this is outdated information because I haven't done this in a long time, but I personally like to, I would prefer things to be not clickable, frankly, yeah. and have them be viewable by the user and not have them be able to get into the weeds. So, and Zach can speak more to that because I know you can do that in Figma, but I don't know how to do it. So yeah. Zach should say just to not anchor the question on tools specifically, uh, I'm like, I also want to know about, you know, what should be the pillar, some basic discipline so that you can restrict your design thinking and, uh, you know, along with that, what tools can you use? Like, this is the question. Uh, so, I mean, uh, go ahead, Zach. Oh, I was just going to say, like, ultimately, ultimately, it's about what you're trying to test, right? Um, by I'm, I'm just I quote from it so often I usually just tell people just go buy the book uh, Google Sprint um, they needed to test whether or not people would be comfortable with a robot concierge right like de delivering things up to their room 
um, they didn't have five years and a hundred million dollars to like build out the tool, right? Like they didn't do an ICO in 2017. So what they did was they got a Roomba. Um, they got a Roomba. They basically, or not a Roomba. It was, it was some sort of like robot. Basically they got an iPad, they programmed out the face, they strapped it. They basically duct taped it to the top of the thing. They made it look nice. And then they figured out how to best simulate the experience, not the software, but the experience that you're trying to build in the product, they tried to, they, they basically tried to outline that. And then they needed, they were trying to determine whether or not, uh, it was successful, whether or not people would be open to it, whether or not this was actually a product that people would be open and comfortable with. So, uh, I would say, don't think about that. I mean, so often we think about the pane of glass that they're, that we're designing as like the prototype, but the prototype isn't the, the pane of glass. The prototype oftentimes can be the experience, the feeling, the uh the problems that they're trying to solve i think something that's really important to remember uh in blockchain for accurate prototyping uh is the asynchronity uh, asynchronousness of the interactions itself right uh in web 2 everything is pretty um pretty instantaneous uh you're you're used to clicking save and it saves you're used to clicking send and it sends etc you're not used to like monitoring uh i mean ironically the only my previous job uh, where we were building tools for uh, replication, backup, and uh, restoration software was actually the closest to it. It was hardware backups. And you could set processes going. You would have to check back, et cetera. Um, but most people aren't used to that. So something to, important to remember is it's not just about designing the paint of glass. It's about replicating an accurate version of the experience that they would be having and then determining whether or not this, is, this, this solves their problem in a way that they would expect and want. Uh, again, 10 to 100x is kind of what you're looking for uh, whenever you're hoping to um, break people out of their just like just good enough sort of behavioral patterns. And then, yeah, Figma, I, honestly, I would say, yes, Figma. Figma is good uh, outside of the asynchronous stuff, but you can use anything. We've used storyboards. We've used uh, we have used what um, at Echo user, Katie, didn't you and Amelia like didn't you all do like the cardboard? Right. Like you like built out some stuff uh, for for space stuff like there's just there's there's literally hundreds of different ways. I wouldn't constrain it down to a software. I would think instead, what experience am I trying to replicate and what's the most ac accurate way in order to build it out? Yeah. As far as the uh, usability or user user experience goes to, I will just add that getting people to speak aloud is the most important thing you can do, because uh, to tell you what they're actually doing and what they're thinking uh, is what you need, because that is, you can get that from a storyboard. And I think one other thing I'll say is that your your fidelity of your prototype should mirror the certainty of your idea. So if your idea is vague and you're not sure if it's the right thing, the test should be very, very much on par with that. In other words, if you're thinking, I think I want to build a new way for people to get a line of credit in a DeFi way, that's not a very specific idea. Cool. Do a storyboard. Like literally draw pictures of someone using a terrible experience where they have no credit and their identity was stolen and then draw an experience where they have this new thing. It can be three panels. I'm not kidding around. And again, if you read Sprint, it'll tell you how to do this. Like it'll literally walk you through it step by step and show it to people and get them to react to it. And if they say like, I don't understand, I don't get it. If they say, I don't get it, like Tom Hanks and Big, if, for those of you who've seen that movie, then go back a step and start again, right? Uh, if you have, if your idea is about to launch, and hopefully, for God, you've done like a billion usability tests and you feel like it's right the right thing, then you should be testing the onboarding flow or you should be testing the, the flow of chatting with someone on the back end. Uh, or you should, you know, you should be doing a high fidelity usability test with a live clickable prototype that is really, really live. Um, if you are somewhere in the middle, it should not be live software that you are testing. Like, mm -hmm. should not, do not do it. It is not worth it. I guarantee you, I literally sat on a call with a Techstars team that I'm mentoring the other day and they wanted to show me their live prototype. It broke three times and I hung up. I'm not kidding. I don't have time for that. I literally don't have time to sit there and watch you try to fix your prototype. I'm too busy. Um, so don't do it. And I'm, I'm not nice now, but like users will be nice and they'll accommodate you. And that's the worst possible thing that can happen because you're not hearing the real feedback, which is, I don't have time to talk to you. Your prototype's broken. Call me back when something works. Just don't risk it. It's like making build slides. Don't risk it. It's going to break. It's not going to work. I don't care how many times you test it. Don't do it until the software. Yeah. 
yeah that's that's really true you know like and you have also told me this earlier like prototype is not equal to an mvp and you don't have to build stuff you have to basically create an experience a uh, tangible experience so people can basically give you feedback and you can uh, you know retrade on it and make sure that your product and whatever you are thinking is right or not and uh, just because we are running out of time like we have five more minutes i want to address this very specific question which we have been pa- facing and you guys can probably answer it the best so we have a lot of people who have built products and built protocols and they are stagnant now they are not getting users and either they want to move on or you know improve and like they are just stuck there because they have dependency from people in their team and their users and they're just stuck and they don't know what to do so what should they do i would highly recommend literally i know this is the beginning of your design week download a virtual version of the sprint book right now and go through the first day today right now go through it what that will help you do is envision the long run question and that question for you if you've got a product that's been out for a year and you have stagnant users is going to be something like do i kill this product or not to Zach's earlier point uh and I guarantee that if you follow that book and you read it, and I'm telling you, it's like 18 point font, you can flip through it and read it. It is very easy to read. I read it on an hour flight once. You can do it. Um, And it's lots of pictures uh, and checklists and easy things to look at. Um, It will walk you through how to get aligned with your team or yourself on what it is that you want to test. And in a couple days to answer that question with a test. I would highly recommend if this is if that's where you are and you have this week to do design, the goal for the end of the week should be to figure out how you're going to pivot or how you're going to kill it. Um, and pivot might be in marketing, right? It might be in getting new users. It might be, it might not be killing the product at all. It might be that you just need to open a new Facebook ad or something, right? Like there's a lot of different ways to pivot um, in marketing, in biz dev, in product, in sales, in, uh, you know, all of it. So I would, I would literally just download that book and walk through it step by step because we could sit here all day and tell you how to do the methods, but that book will tell you how to do it. And it's. There's also, uh, there's also, they, if you're not, I mean, I would definitely recommend reading the book. Um, but Gimlet, uh, media, they started a podcasting company early on. I would say, I want to say like the fifth episode they ever produced was them literally walking through. They were, it's like a cross promotional thing. They were trying to figure out whether or not they needed to build an app. The guys who wrote Google Sprint needed like a really public sort of uh, way to promote the book. And so like they did like a literally a Google Sprint. They walked through it. Uh, and so it's a really good way to like just kind of hear how a- experts kind of work with the product team to build that out. Um, yeah, I love Gimlet Media too. They're amazing. Reply All is like the best podcast on right now. I also love this article. I've shared it a million times, but it's this is a great article. Yeah, this is a good one. Yeah, uh, I I know we are just like uh, out of time now. Like it's two minutes, but uh, uh, like the like this one habit which I want to address, and especially in Web three community is like they just want to build it, build it for fun, and they just wanna uh, don't wanna address the users. They don't want to think about the business or the experience they are selling to the users. So it that's totally fine. I think. If you, if you want to build it for fun, because if, let me put it this way, I, I think it's important for you to be honest, like just in the same way that like you need to be honest about what you want out of a hackathon. Like you go into a hackathon, like what are you looking to get out of it? Are you looking to like get better at coding? Are you looking to win some money? Are you looking to meet people that you may want to start a company with later? Like, I think it's important when you start a project to be honest about what your expect, what your expectations are, right? If you're building it for fun, then you already have a user. It's yourself yeah. and you can continue to build it for yourself and it's great but don't build something that you just want like don't don't build something that you don't want to talk to other people if you think that or sorry be honest with who you're who you're building it for i think would be would be like my strongest recommendation around that right like if people want to build something cool don't tell me it's for other people just just be honest say like yeah i'm i'm really this is something i really like me and five of my friends sometimes that's enough of an audience uber started because but sometimes people are like they want to basically they have built it they're uh, you know seeing investors for their product and there they are on the other hand thinking about what else we can do with the product and they're basically walking on 
another lane of thinking like they can make a web application or another application to support their uh, product as of now like so how to basically make it all you know human centered and make it you know like trying to solve the actual problem and not just you know just getting stuck in the uh, ide the technical and, side yeah yeah exactly yeah yeah yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I think it's important. It's important to keep that in mind. I mean, again, Uber Uber started because Kalanick was curious what it would be like to have a private taxi company for him and thirty of his friends. It was a it was a weekend. It was a it was a it was a he built a prototype in a week. There was no software. It was literally like it was some dudes who were already running like fancy taxi cab stuff. They were like black car service. And he said like, hey, like if someone texts you, here's like a retainer. And if you're free and someone texts you, he like set up a group chat basically between the friends. They didn't even they didn't even build an app. And he was like, oh, wow, people love this. Like that's that's what Uber was. It was a, it was a target market of him plus 30 people. There was no software involved. And now Same thing with Airbnb. Know, yeah, Airbnb. They just wanted to triage like. Like it's about solving. I mean, it's not bad. It's not wrong if you want to solve your own problems first. But like, build. If you're solving your own problems, then you should probably like set a time box on how long you're going to spend on it. Unless like you're getting a ton of technical uh, experience out of it that you're going to use at your next job. Just be really, really go into each project with your eyes open and understand what you're getting out of these out of these projects. I think it's very possible for it to be. Uh your problem is other people's problem. I mean, I think mm -hmm. it fits that mold, frankly. I think Kevin, Kevin Owaki's problem was a lot of other people's problem. Um, I think Kevin is his user in a lot of ways. And I think that that has, has served Gitcoin very, very well, right? I think it mm -hmm. can work. But the size and the same thing for Airbnb and Uber, right? Like there were other people out there that needed a hotel in San Francisco and didn't want to pay a million dollars. Like um, it can work. I think the problem is people don't take the time to figure out is my problem someone else's problem. They just assume that it's someone else's problem because it's their problem. And the reality is that you need to take that deep breath and pause and see if there's a market for what you're building. Um, and like I said in the chat, I mean, if you're planning to get rich, get lots of users, be a co-founder, hire people, retire early, etc., you're not building for fun. It's not fun. That's your job. You want it to be your job. So like... Treat it like your job, because it is. It it is fun, but it's not that sort of type one fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think we have part time now, but uh, you know, like as always, guys, it's just a lot of fun to you know get my head around things that are not inside an ID and not about blockchain, but. Uh, just, you know, like basically human centered, addressing human centered problems and, you know, how to do it, basically how to do the design and kill or, you know, go ahead with the product. And uh, I think we have not been able to cover a lot of questions, but uh, Andy, if you want to say anything at last or if you guys want to share anything, like, uh, it's like, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, what is time anyway? Uh, I have one more. <laughs> I have one more question. You know, I really enjoyed like a this points about be honest about what you're actually engaging in go into it with clear eyes and i want to tie that to what you're saying about a gap analysis between web 2 and web 3 and i wonder if both of you could perhaps very briefly discuss what you think is the most persuasive story because stories are really what bridge the gap right but mm -hmm. like what is the story of you moving from web 2 to web 3 like can you give us what you feel so far are the most persuasive stories for crossing that gap that you've seen in the space Uh, honestly, I feel like the most, well, let me put it this way. The, when I talk to web two people and I talk about the products that I've worked with the products that have come out of the space, um, specifically around relays, the one that turns the most web two heads. So like the one that like people who were not already bought in on like self sovereign identity and, uh, you know, <laughs> owning, owning, the, the gear that you get in Diablo three and being able to transfer that to some other game. Um, the one, the story that everyone really uh, grocks and gets really excited about uh, is enable. Uh, it, was in our, it was our very first relay. Um, it was basically people were, people started with a user, uh, a guy uh, participating in the first relays, first actually Gitcoin hackathon as well. Um, 
they had, he had a friend who was accepted into Stanford and because the loan uh, infrastructure uh, where she was uh, would not essentially give uh, loans out at a high enough rate or sorry, at a high enough amount and a long enough uh, rate uh, that she couldn't go. And so he literally used, he used DeFi. He used, you know, this was in 2018. He used, uh, uh, he used Ethereum uh, to build out a crowdsource uh, student loan platform uh, and got her to, uh, was, it, was it Cornell? I can't remember. It was one of the, it was Cornell. Got her to Cornell. That to me is like, that's the story that like, when I talk to, when I talk to my parents who really don't understand this and are just like, well, what is it? And I was like, oh, well, like people who can't get loans in other countries are suddenly able to crowdsource loans from all over so that they can get a better education. They're like, huh. That's awesome. That's really cool. And I don't have to bring up self-sovereign identity once, which is also a huge plus. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Zach took mine, which is just not fair. That's but, what I, uh, I should have gone first. I should have gone first. Uh, that's what you get. Um, but I think, I think there are many examples like that. And I think, frankly, one of the things that I care deeply about is that Web3, I, I personally think Zach and I've done a ton of analysis on this on the innovation side, is particularly geared for any place where there's opacity, right? And frankly, unfortunately, there's a lot of opacity in our system. There's a lot in healthcare, in geriatric care, in supply chain, in like, and any, to Zach's point, I think when I talk to my parents about blockchain, which they still don't understand, and they still don't understand crypto, I think they still think that I worked at a Bitcoin company for the last two years. Uh, they, um, they understand when you talk about supply chain, they understand that people are trying to cheat the system. They understand when you talk about geriatric care and people are spending $60,000 to put their parents in nursing homes and not knowing where it's going. Uh, you know, they, they understand when people are taking advantage of other people and that shining a light into that is something that's sorely needed. Government, politics, media. Every time we did a relay on something like that and people were talking about how to, how to eradicate fake news, uh, my parents could understand that. And so... I think anytime you see opacity, anytime you see opacity in our system, it's an opportunity and it's worth questioning why there's so much opacity. Exactly this, this last year, and I, I know I'm over such and I, I promise I'll stop, but like this last year has taught us that there is a lot of shit in the way of getting stuff done, like getting everybody tested, getting everybody to admit to having a virus so that we can start opening things again. Um, you know, being able to attest to having had this disease is something that is a web three solution waiting to be made, right? Like, and globally, it's an opportunity for doctors and hospitals and insurers and governments to work together. Like, and yet there's so much goddamn opacity in the way we are trapped in our homes in the United States because we can't get out of our own way, right? Like, so it's, I, I don't know. I think when you start talking about opacity and you start talking about the core tenets of what mm -hmm. web three is actually like able to do uh it's a completely different conversation than well you need a blockchain blah, blah, this is how the distributed ledger is gonna work and people are like i just i just emotionally shut down because i can't take it anymore <laughs> like so so i think when you talk about opacity you talk about eradicating opacity eradicating lies eradicating just you know deception it's a complete yep yep uh again guys like it was a lot of fun and i know we are off time now but uh we'll be catching up uh with zach uh and maybe katie on slack of kernel so we'll be making a design channel design thing channel and you guys can ask all of your questions there and we as peers can help each other out figure out i already saw one comment from in slack from veronica where she has uh, built a user research form and uh please help her you know figure out stuff okay guys uh ciao and uh <laughs> yeah um what's the story about brahma we will uh take this up in the channel and uh yeah yeah uh, let's uh let's uh close it and thank you everyone thanks everybody bye, -bye. bye.